Radio Canada International presents the Wayne Pronger story. It is a story of courage, although the man who tells it wouldn't use that word. It's also a life story, or at least a view of a life to date by the extraordinary man who has lived it. There are dark chapters that he wants to forget, preferring to dwell on the hope in his life now. Country music is a large part of that hope. So is the friendship of someone who can bring his music to life as the writer cannot. You'll hear the actual voice of the writer briefly. And then you'll hear the voice of Rex Hagen telling his story for him for a reason that you'll immediately understand. My name is my name is Wayne Pronger. I was born in Woodstock, Ontario, April 16, 1942. I was born with cerebral palsy. At the beginning, the doctor said that I wouldn't live. My parents left me at the age of four. My grandparents took me in, and it was the best thing that ever happened to me. It wasn't easy for them, because I couldn't even sit up for a long time. But my grandma's love and determination won out. While I was on my back, she used to talk to me, trying to get me interested in things around me. She'd say, where are grandma's pretty flowers? And I would turn my head to look at them. And then they knew that there was hope. My granddad's name was William Henry Legg, but I called him Bill. I guess it was easier for me to say. He always helped his fellow man. He sure did a lot for me. He made me a wagon so I could push myself around the yard. Also a set of parallel bars and pulleys with sandbags on the end. I used to have to stretch my arms and pull myself up. I now know this is why I'm able today to use my body as much as I can. Granted, I can't stand or walk because CP has affected my balance. But my arms and hands and legs and feet are strong. And I owe it all to my grandparents and their undying will for me to make the best I could of myself. When I was six, I had a teacher come to the house. I had to do it all by memory because I couldn't write. But one Christmas, I received an electric typewriter. Huh. I remember how excited I was on Christmas morning when I got up. I finally did some of my homework on it, but I can only use one finger to type. And by the time I really got going, I had to quit school. Because the Board of Education only supplied a tutor until I was 16 and I had no way of getting to school. In that same year, Bill took ill with viral pneumonia, and he died a few months later. So I became the man of the house. It was a big house with a big yard. He had Grandma. She and I stayed there by ourselves for three years. We had a big garden, and the grass often needed cutting, but she did the best that she could. I might say here that my Grandma is a very small woman. She looks like a little doll, even now when she's 89 years old. I was getting older all the time. I couldn't do for him what I wanted to do. So. And he was so big, you know, he was so tall. I couldn't manage him. I worked hard for him, with him, you know. Well, the doctor said that they didn't think he would live, and they just put him to one side and, and didn't bother much with him. And I said, well, where there's life, there's hopes. I'd do what I could for him, and maybe the doctors are not always right. I knew he was so fond of music, you know, because if I'd put it on, he'd just dance and wiggle around it. I knew he liked music, but um, I never expected he'd go as far as he's gone with it. One afternoon, just before supper time, I was sitting watching TV with my back to the kitchen when I heard a hard thudding noise. I turned my head to see what had caused it, and it was Grandma. She'd fallen and hit her head on the corner of the sink. 
She was knocked out and bleeding from her forehead. I, I didn't know what to do. I couldn't help her, and, and I couldn't dial the phone to try to get help for her. Finally, after a few minutes, which seemed like hours to me, she got up and phoned a relative, Ed, and told him what had happened. Ed took her to the hospital, where they put some stitches in her head, but she was badly enough hurt that they kept her in the hospital. While she was there, the doctor came into her room and sat on the side of her bed. He said, I understand that you have a grandson in a wheelchair that you've been taking care of for 20 years. And Grandma said, yes, that's right. The doctor said, well, you're not going to be able to do it anymore. Grandma and I were both very upset because we didn't know what we could do or, or where I could go. So I decided to go into a nursing home. Oh, granted, it was for elderly people who could no longer care for themselves, and I was a very young man, but there was nowhere else, and I was lucky to get in. The staff was nice, and I guess so was the home itself, but I missed my own home and the life I had had with my grandma very much. I was lonely. And every night to find the love that used to be so warm and bright. But now, when I come home, I find you're only in my mind. I'm all alone and so blue. My life is empty. I knew what I really needed was a home and parents of my own. Everyone in the nursing home was so old and feeble. I was young and it was not good for me. One day a lady at the hospital asked me if I had heard of a place they were building in Markham which was going to be called Participation House. A group of concerned parents who were very worried about what would happen to their children, who were also CP, when they, the parents, because of aging or illness, would no longer be able to care for their children themselves. They realized that, well, short of a nursing home, there was no place for their boys and girls who were fast becoming men and women. Well, at first, I didn't want to go. Ed talked to me about it and said he thought it was a good idea and would be much better for me. But I didn't think so, not at first. Then my doctor spoke to me, and he agreed with Ed that I should be with younger people. So I thought, what the hell? I'll give it a try. I was so unsure if I was doing the right thing, but it was sure the right move for me. I won't say it wasn't very lonely at first, it was quite a change for me. There's a workshop at PH, and when I first went there, I went to work in it every day. I enjoyed the companionship of the people I met there, as there were volunteers as well as residents. However, since my hands seemed to have a mind of their own due to my spastic condition, there wasn't too much I could accomplish, and I found the work very frustrating and hard on my nerves. I was still hoping to meet someone to be my parents. Perhaps it was seeing all the others with loving parents that made me feel so, so alone. Oh, Betty and Ed, they were very good to me and they would come to see me and, and bring Grandma as often as they could and take me home to Woodstock for visits too. But it was a long drive for them from Woodstock and back and I had this terrible need for a family of my very own and it was getting worse all the time. Our volunteer coordinator at the time was Mrs. Shirley Piper. She's another dear friend of mine I made at PH. I was determined to learn to feed myself, but I was getting nowhere fast. Shirley was working very hard trying to get volunteers for our different activities at PH. In the course of her travels, she went into a drugstore in Markham and told a lady there about how some of us were trying to help ourselves as much as we could but we needed volunteers to bring the outside world in as well as to help us make it. 
This lady's name was Mrs. Ruby Forrest, and she had a good friend with a CP child who Ruby thought a lot of, so she knew a little bit about it and told Shirley she would like to visit as a volunteer. Well, Ruby and I worked hard together trying to get me to feed myself. She came three times a day for over a month to help me with my meals. We didn't make much headway in that area because my shoulders were too spastic, and no matter what we tried, I couldn't get enough control of my fingers. But we were getting to know each other, and she began trying to help me in other ways. Well, for example, I had a special phone called a companion set, but I couldn't dial it. But when Ruby saw my electric typewriter, she said if I could type, there must be some way I could learn to use the phone. She talked it over with her husband, and he came to see me too, and he built up my phone in the same way my typewriter was built up, so that I could hit each number individually and not run the risk of hitting two or three all at once. I no longer need the numbers partitioned off, as I'm not nearly so spastic as I was when I first met Ruby and her husband. His name is Bill, like my granddad, but I don't call him that. I call him Dad, and Ruby is my mom now. Yeah, after all the loneliness, after all the fears, I've got a family who really love me and want me. Mom and I are very close, and Dad and I are getting closer all the time. She calls me every morning, and I call her every evening before I go to bed. Hello? Hello, Mom. Hi. How's it going? Oh, good. Uh, um, How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I'm fine. Did you have a good sleep? Yeah. That's good. Oh, good. Huh? Dad. Oh, he's fine. He said they were awfully busy because all this rain that came down came down too hard and they had water in their cables. But anyway, he's fine. He said he might be over after supper to check the water in your uh, batteries for you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Didn't I have to sleep? Sleep. Everything I want to do, I have to sleep. No. Yeah, but just be glad you've got the energy, Wayne, to do it. Uh, in this world, Wayne, uh, especially, it seems, for handicapped people, if you, if you don't have the guts to fight, you might as well go down the drain because you don't get too much help from those... Ever since I was a small boy, I had this other dream which I guess was an even older dream than wanting my own parents. Back then, I had Bill and Ma, and I had my wagon for getting around. But Bill and I used to listen to the Grand Old Opry on Saturday nights from Nashville, Tennessee. Well, I enjoyed it so much, I could hardly wait for Saturday night to come. I was right there on the stage with the singers. I could see them, and my dream was that someday, somehow, before I died, I'd get to Nashville. I just had to meet all these happy people who, even when they sing sad songs, somehow let you know there's a better day coming. Maybe, if one can just hang in there. And something hit me right out of the blue. Why couldn't I write a song and have someone sing it for me? I knew I couldn't sing it. Even if I could, no one would understand my singing but I sure could hear it in my head. I'd been hearing bits of songs that I made up in my head for years, but for some strange reason it never hit me until that night to even try to write a song. I decided to write a song about what my grandma meant to me. I called it, She is Still a Star to Me. When I was a child of four, the doctor said I wouldn't live anymore. Although hope was gone, she
she still carried on although she has grown old she's worth more than gold to me and when i did wrong she was always there to teach me right from wrong and when i I kept on writing songs, but I wished I were able to speak more clearly, as apart from the very odd person, most people found me very hard to understand. Lucky me, along comes another volunteer to PH. She used to be on the stage in England, and she took on the job as a volunteer to help me with my speech. Another reason I worked hard to correct my speech as much as I could was because I wanted so badly to be able to communicate not only with my old friends who were getting kind of the hang of the way I said my words, but the new friends I was making, and especially those in the country music field. I mean, how in the world could I make them understand my music if they couldn't even understand my speech? Just about this time, I met a disc jockey, Frank Proctor, and I must say right here that that was a very, very lucky day for me. When I met Frank, it really all started to come together for me as far as my music goes. I'm Frank Proctor, and I uh, was an announcer at the time for CFGM radio station. And uh, the people at Participation House had a, a special evening they wanted a, an MC for. They wanted me to bring down some records. There were a lot of people at Participation House who were country music fans. And they said, would you come down and play the records for the people? I said, sure. So I went down and uh, met a lot of the nice people down there. And after the show, one of the uh, organizers of the, that particular night said, uh, listen, there's somebody over here who really wants to meet you. He listens to you every day. I said, sure, who's that? He said, there was a fellow here by the name of Wayne Pronger. And I saw this uh, man sitting over in a wheelchair, and he was just bouncing up and down. Because as with, I'm sure you know that uh, in, in radio, people, you're, you're like part of the family after a while. And Wayne had listened to me on the air, and he thought he really knew me. Of course, I'd never met him before. And I must admit, uh, right off the top, not having dealt with uh, really many people at all who uh, had cerebral palsy, it took me quite a while to understand um, his speech. And I kind of persevered, and we, we talked for about half an hour, and then he took me back to his room, and he showed me what he was... He was so excited on the way down the hallway. I remember this vividly. He was trying to tell me something, and I was really searching to grasp whatever he was saying. It had to do with country music. I knew that. And he had to do something with writing, but I wasn't sure whether he was the writer or whether somebody else was the writer. So when we got to the room, I found out that Harry was doing all this work uh, of writing songs all on his own at this, before this time, before I met him. He must have had, uh, I'll bet, 150 songs all written down, all typed out. And uh, some of them were very good and close to being finished. Let me tell you something. When, when I, after, just shortly after I'd met him, and I'd seen how he had to type the songs and I had to go at it just so painstakingly to get these lines out on the typewriter without getting 14 letters that he didn't want there because his arms were fairly spastic and his fingers were fairly spastic. Uh, he said to me, no, he said, Where, how can I put the music? How can I get the music to go with these lines? And I said, well, gee, uh, I don't know, let's, you know, figure out some sort of system where, you know, you write down maybe the note. Do you, can you read music? I didn't even know at that point that he couldn't read music. He can't read music. Okay, so we established that. So he's got the tunes in his head. He can't get them down on the lines. He can't describe to anyone. They happen to have one of those, uh, the small organs at the um, at Participation House. So I went there one day, and um, he said, Come on with me, Frank. You know, and I said, Oh, oh, what's up now, Wayne? So we went down the hall. And we went into the little room where they have the organ. And there he is. He's playing the notes by nose with his nose. He was bending down and pressing. And he's, that's the one. He had indicated that's the note. 
he wanted to start that particular song with, and then he'd go down or up or whatever the case may be. But he did that for quite a while. He tried he tried to learn. Uh, and in fact, he had a music teacher come in. A fellow tried to teach him playing the, this uh, electric organ with his nose. He was ju he would not give up. He won't say no. He won't quit until he succeeds. That guy's incredible. The Wayne Pronger Story. A radio show started up at Minkler Auditorium at Seneca College. It was patterned after Grand Old Opry and was called Opry North. Frank was to be their MC. What a break for me! Frank took me to their first show and practically to every show they've put on since. And here, every other Sunday night, thanks to Frank, I was meeting men like myself. Well, maybe not quite like myself. I was the only one in a wheelchair, and they were able to play their guitars and get their music out of their heads. But somehow, while there, my wheelchair didn't seem to be anything except something to sit in. And everyone made me feel I really belonged there. On stage here at Opry North at the Minkler Auditorium, I have with me a very special person who normally is here anyway. His name is Wayne Pronger. For those of you, for those of you who have been to Opry North, either here in the audience tonight or have been here before, you'll recognize immediately when I say he's the young man you see in the wheelchair sitting on stage each and every Opry North. He can possibly make it down. He has been doing that since we started with Opry North. He truly loves the show, and I'm not overemphasizing that word love. He really does. He lives this show. For the past four years, as a matter of fact, Wayne has had music inside him that because of his particular disability, which happens to be cerebral palsy, he just cannot seem to be able to get it out. At least it was not the case until recently on an Opry North presentation of Tom Kelly's a little while ago when, he was, when Tom was on the show here last time. He met Wayne Pronger. They struck up a friendship. That friendship has blossomed into more than just that. They are now musical partners. Tom has been able to get those tunes that have been circulating in Wayne's head, get it down on paper, and get more importantly, get it out of a guitar and into real solid music that I know you are going to enjoy. It's a very proud evening for this young man. Let's welcome Tom Kelly to do one of Wayne's songs. way to Nashville, Tennessee. I'm as happy as I can be. Gonna see all the stars, might even take my own guitar. Gonna play underneath stars. Now we get there, oh, what a thrill that'll be. I'm heading out there, there's no doubt here I come, Nashville, One Tennessee. Sunday night, I was sitting in the dressing room waiting for Frank. This is so important to me, I, I hardly know how to tell it or, or what words to use. As I said, I, I was waiting for Frank, and along came a man whose name is Tom Kelly. Tom was on that night. He writes and plays his guitar and sings. He asked me about myself and what I did. Wherever I go, I take my book of songs with me, so I showed some to him, and he was really interested. And so we exchanged phone numbers. About a week later, I called him. He was getting his hair cut, but came to the phone anyway and spoke to me. I asked him if there was any chance of us getting together about my music, and he said, How about Monday afternoon? Oh, I was in seventh heaven. I, I had such a feeling about Tom and my work. But a man like that is, is a busy man, and I was almost afraid to hope. People had tried to help before. Most were just too busy, and none could hear what I could hear. But Tom told me the night I met him that if I could type words, I could also learn to type music notes. Tom came to see me when he said he would, and that afternoon we worked on our first song.
two hours, we had it on tape, and it was the way I heard it in my head. I could hardly believe it, and yet it felt so right. What a feeling it was for me. When I had you. When I had you, my world so came bright. Now when I come home, I find I'm alone. When I reach for the light, and my arms are empty without you. Without your love, I don't know what to do. My life begins and ends. Tom came back every day for a while until we really got the hang of working together. Now when I write my songs, I triple space and put the notes under the words, and it gives Tom a better idea of how I hear them. Sometimes, like the first song we worked on, they fall into place almost immediately. Sometimes it takes a little longer, and sometimes a lot longer. And then again, to use Tom's expression, it's like flogging a dead horse. <laughs> so we leave it and go on to something else. When I met Wayne, I was in, uh, like, uh, I, I'm a, I write a lot, and uh, and you you get to a point uh, where you're respond when you're responsible for your own time entirely. You can get to a point where you you just kind of focus inward, inward, inward all the time to the where you you can't hear anything except your own bowel movements after a while, you know? And uh, I was uh, sort of at that kind of a point when, when I met Wayne. And uh, I I just decided uh, that uh, it would be a good thing to do something that, uh, that kind of got my gaze a little uh, away from myself for a while, you know? And that was the reason I, that, uh, that I started working with Wayne. It just was because it seemed like here was a chance that, that the mu uh, to have the music, to me, I, I consider it a, it's a gift to have the music. It's a gift. And I think that, uh, that uh, it stay like you appreciate it when you, can, when you can share it. And it seemed like this was a chance where, where that could happen, you know, where, where the music that I had could... Uh, could really do something, you know, because, uh, and so, and, and it happened that way. So it was like, but in the process of, in working with Wayne and in getting to know him, I had, I've learned some things about, uh, Wayne doesn't recognize limitations, you know. Like when you first meet him, people had, I think that, that people for the most part tend to kind of take a fairly superficial attitude toward people, other people, and and the body has a lot to do with the way that you react to someone, you know? And I've come to consider, like, uh, the things about Wayne that, that, that people would associate with being handicapped. To me, they're just kind of like a camouflage, because they're, behind that is, is a songwriter, a, a, an intelligent human being behind this camouflage, see? And I, I was, uh, like, when I first met him, I was apprehensive. I didn't know, like, it, Wayne was an unusual person to me. I didn't, you know, I, uh, I didn't understand him at all, and I think the, the, my human response was to kind of back off and, you know. But after listening to him for a while and, and relaxing myself, I started to get through the camouflage. And, and I've come to re realize something about that. Through being with Wayne, I've gained a kind of a strength through being with Wayne 
that uh, I don't think I would have had. I told you my dream about Nashville? Well, one of the sponsors of Opry North is Travelways Bus Lines. And one night I heard them advertising a trip to Nashville. This was before I met Tom, but I got to thinking of it and talked it over with Mom, and she said she would go with me if it meant so much to me. But that maybe, since so many of my friends here at PH also like country music, maybe we could get enough interested to make up a busload. I sent away for all the details and got so excited just thinking about it, I sat down and wrote a song called I'm On My Way to Nashville, Tennessee. When I hear Ernest talk, I'm a walk in the floor over you. No more will I be blue, cause I'll be happy as I can be down in Nashville, Tennessee. It was the third one Tom and I worked on, and this was before I started putting in my notes. But it fell into place right away. I'm on my way to Nashville, Tennessee. I'm as happy as I can be. When he played his guitar, it was just the way I heard it in my head. It was so right, especially the part about Ernest Tubb and walking the floor over you. Walking the floor over you. Down in Nashville, Tennessee. That really sent me, and Tom too, and still does when I hear that part. You see, country music is really my whole life. It's my work, but it's also my great pleasure. When I write my songs, I hear a certain voice, such as Johnny Cash, Ernest Tubb, Charlie Pride singing them. And that, along with my notes, tells Tom how I want them to sound. And then when Tom Kelly sings them, they, they come alive for me. And I really hear them the way I want them to be. I've been alone for long. Since my darling left. I still can't believe it. All my dreams are coming true. I wanted and needed parents. Now I have them and a family too. I have many good friends, especially Frank and now Tom, who's also answered my prayer of ever finding someone who could hear my music. Some people ask me if writing songs is difficult for me and say they couldn't do it. Well, it would be a lot harder for me to stop writing them. Sometimes I wake up in the morning hearing the words and the music so clearly I can't wait to get it on paper. Other times I sit down to my typewriter and a song just seems to write itself. I don't really understand it, but that's the way it is. I just write what I feel at that time. I do have one other dream. It's a very important dream to me. And my song, Is There Anyone Out There For Me, tells it all. Yes, it's hard when you come home And find the joy all alone And the love that once was there You see, a wheelchair does hinder a man a bit his search for female companionship. I'm very lucky in my friends, both men and women, and in my childhood memories and my new family. But, oh, how I do wonder, is there anyone out there for me? Wayne Pronger's story was read by Rex Hagen and was produced by Len Scher with the assistance of Madeline McLaughlin. Technical operations were by Larry Morey, Doug McKenzie, and John Lewis. 
Wayne's songs, as you heard them in this program, and in the Radio Canada International program devoted entirely to his music, were sung by his friend and collaborator Tom Kelly and produced by Mark Goldman. The Wayne Pronger story was co-produced for Radio Canada International by Susan Lumsden and Mark Goldman. Is there anyone out there who would like to share my life with me? Because I'm tired of living with all those memories. Is there anyone out there for me? Is there anyone out there for me? Is there
I'm alone each night And you know this feeling that I have I can't deny Since our two hearts said goodbye These tears that I cried for you You know I cannot hide What a fool I was to ever let you go When I had you, my world was so gay and bright. Now when I come home, I find I'm alone. When I reach for the light, and my arms are empty without you. Without your love, I don't know what to do. My life begins and ends. Feeling that I have, I can't deny. Since our two hearts said goodbye. I'm alone each night, and you know this feeling that I have, I can't deny. Since our two hearts. Goodbye. These tears that I cried for you, you know I cannot hide what a fool I was to ever let you go. When I had you, my world was so gay and bright. Now.
each and every night to find the love that used to be so warm and bright. But now when I come home, I find you only in my mind. I'm all alone and so blue. My life is empty. Climb the stairs, my lonely room, open the door like I have so many times before. I walk from room to room, I find the house filled with gloom, and I'm lost without you. Life is empty without you. My life is empty without you. I come home every night, longing to make things right, but you're not there to hold. Like I have so many times before, I walk from room to room. I find the house filled with bloom, and I'm lost without you. God knows the house is not home. Mm.
saw the sun setting I dreamed that I'd hold you in my arms tonight You've been gone too long And all I look forward to is holding you tight When we're walking together in the pale moonlight I know this feeling's not right Without you, my darling, my world is at an end Oh, I wish you were my darling And not just my friend Since our two hearts have parted This feeling won't end Oh, I wish you were my darling Cause we're not just friends Think of tomorrow, waking alone in the bed. I'm living on memories, and nothing seems right in my head. But I'll face tomorrow, and I'll face the memories. They come in through a hurt that won't mend. Without you, my darling, my world. Darling, and not just my friend Since our two hearts have parted This feeling won't mend Oh, I wish you were my darling Cause we're not just friends I 
what she means to me I don't want her to know that I love her so And every time I see her I can't let it show That I'm longing to hold her and kiss her tenderly But I can't let her know what she means to me Cause I know that I'll never be free And it's tearing the heart right out of me But I'll never let it show I can't let her know that I love her small cafe When I met her I knew right away I wanted to hold her But it's hard when a man isn't free Although I love her I can't let her know what she means to me I don't want her to know that I love her so Every time I see her I can't let it show I'm longing to hold her and kiss her tenderly But I can't let her know what she means to me Cause I know that I'll never be free And it's tearing the heart right out of me But I'll never let it show I can't let her know that I love her so
now that you're gone and there's no one here with me and i'm trying to forget an old memory and i'm trying to forget an old memory i'm trying to forget the way Now that we're gone and there's no one here with me and I'm trying to forget no
when I was a child of four The doctor said I wouldn't live anymore Though hope was gone She still carried on Although she has grown old She's worth more than gold to me And when I did wrong Always there to teach me right from wrong When I was sad She was always there to make me feel glad When I saw the sweet smiling face I will always have a memory The time cannot erase My luck is running low She would never tell me no She is the dearest friend That I've ever known Although her hair has turned to grey Her memory will not go astray Although I have become a man I will always understand what she would have me to be. She is still a star to me. I will always have a memory the time cannot erase. She is still a star to me. And with God's good grace, I know